the divided kingdom, southern kingdom of Judah. In this session, we focus on Judah, the southern kingdom, which was ruled by kings from the Davidic dynasty. Unlike the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah experienced relatively stable governance. However, this stability did not translate into spiritual faithfulness. The people of Judah often strayed from God's commandments, leading to significant consequences. This lecture explores the scenes that led to the prophecy of exile, the prophets sent by God with messages to his people, and the role and significance of the prime minister, which provides insight into our understanding of the papacy. The kings of Judah, the Vedic monarchy, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 15. Rehoboam, son of Solomon and grandson of David, initially ruled over the united monarchy of Israel. However, his harsh policies, policies led to the rebellion of the ten northern tribes, resulting in the split of the kingdom around 932 and or 931 BC. Rehoboam's rule over the kingdom of Judah the southern kingdom was marked by instability and subjugation to Egypt following an Egyptian incursion led by Pharaoh Sisak. Despite his royal lineage, Rehoboam failed to uphold the spiritual and moral standards established by David and Solomon. His reign exemplifies the consequences of abandoning wise counsel and succumbing to pride and harshness. Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, 2 Kings chapter 8. Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, began his reign at the age of 32 and ruled for eight years. His marriage to Atalia, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel of Israel, was a political alliance that brought significant turmoil to Judah. To secure his throne, Jehoram killed his six brothers, an act that further alienated him from God's favor. His reign was characterized by idolatry and moral decline, influenced heavily by his wife Atalia. Atalia. Jehoram's alliance with Israel through marriage to Atalia led to the introduction of Baal worship in Judah, which brought God's judgment upon the nation. Juas, the narrowing of the royal line. Juas became king at the tender age of six, following a period of significant upheaval. His grandfather, Atalia, had seized the throne and ruled ruthlessly promoting Baal worship. Juas' reign began under the guardianship of the high priest Jehoiada, who was instrument in restoring the worship of Yahweh and repairing the temple. Juas reigned for 40 years and initially showed great zeal for God's ways. However, after Jehoiada's death, Juas was influenced by other officials and reverted to idolatry, leading to his eventual downfall. Joah's reign illustrates the impact of godly mentorship and the dangers of succumbing to negative influences. Hosea, Asariya, 2 Kings, chapter 15, verse 1 to 7. Hosea, also known as Asariya, ascended to the throne at 16 and reigned for 42 years. His reign was one of the longest and most prosperous in Judah's history. Uzziah was initially faithful to God, and under his leadership, Judah experienced military success and economic prosperity. He fortified Jerusalem, built up the army, and encouraged agriculture. However, his pride led to his downfall. In a moment of hubris, 
Uzziah unlawfully entered the temple to burn incense, a duty reserved for priests. This act resulted in God striking him with leprosy, and he lived in isolation until his death. Hosea's reign highlights the importance of humility and obedience to God's commands. Ahaz and Hezekiah, 2 Kings, chapter 18. Ahaz's reign. Ahaz, one of the most faithless kings of Judah, reigned during a time of great spiritual decline. He embraced idolatry, even sacrificing his son in pagan rituals and made alliances with Assyria rather than trusting in God. His actions lead to Judah's vulnerability and subjugation to foreign powers. As Ahaz's reign serves as a stark reminder of the consequences of abandoning faith in God and seeking security through ungodly means. Hezekiah's reign. In contrast, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, was a reformer king who sought to restore Judah's spiritual integrity. He removed high places, smashed uh, sacred stones, and cut down Asira poles, centralizing worship in Jerusalem. Hezekiah's reign was marked by his faithfulness to God, particular, particularly during the Assyrian invasion led by King Sinachirib. Hezekiah's reliance on God and the prophetic counsel of Isaiah led to a miraculous deliverance of Jerusalem from the Assyrian threat. His reforms and dedication to God highlight the power of faithful leadership and the importance of seeking divine guidance in times of crisis. Prophets sent to Judah The role of prophets in Judah was pivotal as they were God's messengers tasked with calling the nation back to faithfulness. They warned of impending judgments, exhorted the people to repent, and provided glimpses of hope and restoration. The prophets of Judah can be categorized into major and minor prophets based on the length and scope of their writings, but their messages were equally vital in guiding the spiritual and moral direction of the nation. Major and Minor Prophets Distinction between Major and Minor Prophets The major prophets, including Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, are so named because their books are longer and contain more com complex prophecies that op often address not only Judah but also other nations and future events of global significance. Their extensive writings provided deep theological insights and broad implications for understanding God's plan. On the other hand, the minor prophets such as Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Juna, Mika, Nahum, Habakkuk, Siphania, Haggai, Sikaria, and Malachi delivered shorter and more concise messages. Despite their brevity of, of their books, the minor prophets address critical issues of their time and call the people of Judah to repentance and renewal. Their prophecies were focused on specific aspects of social justice, idolatry, and covenant faithfulness. Isaiah the structure of Isaiah's prophecies. Isaiah's prophetic ministry is encapsulated in the book that bears his name, which is traditionally divided into two major sections, the book of Woes, chapter 1 to 39, and the book of Consolation, chapters 40 to 55. Book of Woes, chapters 1 to 39. The first section, known as the book of Woes, primarily consists of denunciations and warnings. Isaiah lifts his voice against the backslidings of the people of Judah and charges them with sin and impiety as the cause of their troubles. He uses vivid 
imagery to defect the nation's spiritual condition, comparing them to a vineyard that produces only wild grapes, despite God's care. Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 to 7. The prophet condemns social injustices, idolatry, and the people's misplaced trust in political alliances rather than in God. This section includes several woo oracles that highlight the severity of Judah's sins and the impending judgment they would face if they did not repent. Isaiah also rebukes the leaders of Judah for their corruption and reliance on foreign powers for security instead of trusting in the Lord. One of the most notable prophecies in this section is the vision of the coming Messiah, the Prince of Peace, who will establish justice and righteousness. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 to 7. Despite the grim warnings, Isaiah provides glimpses of hope, promising that a remnant will return and that God's ultimate plan of salvation will prevail. Book of Consolation Chapters 40 to 55. The second section, the Book of Consolation, shifts focus from judgment to comfort and redemption. Written to encourage the Jewish remnant that would be delivered from Babylonian captivity, this section offers profound messages of hope and restoration. Isaiah emphasizes God's enduring faithfulness and his promise to redeem his people. The opening verses set the tone. Comfort, comfort my people, says God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. Isaiah chapter 40 verses 1 to 2. This part of Isaiah's prophecy includes some of the most well-known messianic prophecies such as the prediction of John the Baptist ministry as a voice crying in the wilderness Isaiah chapter 40 verses 3 to 5 and the powerful depiction of the suffering servant who bears the sin of many Isaiah chapter 53 the book of consolation consolation reassures the people of Judah that despite their current suffering and exile God has not abandoned them. Instead, He promises to bring them back to their land and restore their fortunes. Jeremiah Jeremiah's Prophetic Role Jeremiah, often referred to as the weeping prophet due to his heartfelt laments over the fate of Judah, played a crucial role in calling the nation to repentance. His ministry spanned the final years of Judah before the Babylonian exile and, the, and he witnessed firsthand the consequences of the nation's persistent idolatry and social injustices. Jeremiah's prophecies were marked by symbolic actions that illustrated God's messages. For instance, he buried a linen belt to signify, to signify the ruined Pride of Judah, Jeremiah chapter 13 verses 1 to 11, and smashed a clay jar to symbolize the impending destruction of Jerusalem, Jeremiah 19:10 to 11. Despite facing intense opposition, imprisonment, and threats to his life, Jeremiah remained steadfast in delivering God's warnings, exile, and return. One of Jeremiah's significant prophecies was the prediction of a 70-year exile in Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 11 to 12. He warned that Judah's continuous rebellion and failure to heed God's commands would result in their captivity. This prophecy was fulfilled when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, conquered Jerusalem and exiled many of its inhabitants. However, Jeremiah's message was not solely one of doom. He also conveyed God's promise of restoration. In Jeremiah chapter 29 verses 10 to 11, 
he assures the exiles that after 70 years, God would bring them back to their homeland. This promise of return and renewal offered hope to the people, emphasizing God's mercy and faithfulness despite their unfaithfulness. Ezekiel, Ezekiel's Prophetic Role Ezekiel, a contemporary of Jeremiah, prophesied during the Babylonian exile. His ministry was marked by vivid visions and dramatic symbolic acts that conveyed God's messages to the exiled community. Ezekiel's prophecies address both the immediate situation of the exiles and the future restoration of Israel. Ezekiel's visions included the famous vision of the dry bones, symbolizing the revival and restoration of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14. He also depicted the glory of God departing from the temple due to the people's sins and promise its return once they repented. Ezekiel chapters 10 verses 18 to 19 and chapter 43 verses 1 to 5. Ezekiel's messages of judgment and hope reinforce the themes of accountability and divine mercy. Minor Prophets Hosea Hosea's ministry focused on Israel's unfaithfulness, using his own marriage to an unfaithful wife as a powerful metaphor for the relationship between God and Israel. Hosea called the people to return to God and forsake their idolatrous practices. His prophecies highlighted God's enduring love and willingness to forgive despite Israel's repeated betrayals. Joel Joel's prophecies centered on the theme of the day of the Lord, a time of divine judgment and salvation. He called the people to repentance, warning of a locust plague as a precursor to reap greater judgment. Joel also offered hope, promising that God would pour out his spirit on all people in the future, a prophecy fulfilled at Pentecost, Joel chapter 2, verses 28 to 32, and Acts chapter 2, verses 16 to 21. Amos Amos, a shepherd and fig tree farmer, was called by God to prophesy against the social injustices of Israel. He denounced the exploitation of the poor, corruption, and complacency of the wealthy. Amos emphasized that true worship must be accompanied by justice and righteousness. His call for social reform and integrity remains relevant today. Micah Micah's prophecies address both Israel and Judah, focusing on the injustices and corruption prevalent in society. He foretold the fall of Samaria and Jerusalem, but also provided a vision of future peace and restoration. Micah is known for his powerful declaration of what God requires, that is, to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God, with your God. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 Siphania Siphania warned of the coming day of the Lord, a time of judgment for Judah and the surrounding nations. He called for repentance and reform, emphasizing that God's judgment was imminent. Despite the dire warnings, Siphania also conveyed a message of hope, promising that God would restore a remnant of humble and righteous people. 
Conclusion The prophets sent to Judah played crucial roles in guiding the nation back to God. Through their messages of judgment, repentance, and hope, they called the people to faithfulness and obedience. The distinctions between major and minor prophets highlight the varied ways God communicated His will, but all share the common purpose, that is to remind Judah of their covenant relationship with God and the need for genuine worship and justice. The prophetic books of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the Twelve Minor Prophets remain vital to understanding God's redemptive plan and the enduring importance of faithfulness to His commands. Jeremiah's Message to Judah Jeremiah's role as a prophet was integral during one of the most tumultuous periods in Judah's history. His prophecies, marked by profound emotional depth and unwavering commitment, delivered stern warnings and hopeful promises, calling the nation to repentance and faithfulness to God. Jeremiah's ministry highlighted both the imminent judgment due to Judah's sins and the enduring hope of restoration. Jeremiah's Prophetic Role Jeremiah, often referred to as the weeping prophet, is a vivid example of a man deeply dedicated to his divine calling, despite intense personal suffering and public opposition. Born into a priestly family in Anatot, Jeremiah's prophetic ministry began around 627 BC during the reign of King Josiah and extended, extended through the reigns of the last kings of Judah, culminating in the Babylonian exile. The Call to Prophecy Jeremiah's call to prophecy is dramatically described in the first chapter of the book bearing his name. God appointed him as a prophet to the nations before his birth, and his mission was to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 10. This divine mandate underscored the dual nature of his ministry, that is, pronouncing judgment and offering hope. Prophetic prophecies against idolatry and social injustices. Injustice. Throughout his ministry, Jeremiah confronted the rampant idolatry and social injustices in Judah. The people had turned away from Yahweh adapting the worship of Baal and other deities, practices that included child sacrifice and other abominations. Jeremiah passionately denounced these actions, warning that such behaviors would lead to national ruin. In addition to idolatry, Jeremiah condemned the social injustices prevalent in Judah. He decried the exploitation of the poor, corruption among leaders, and the overall moral decay. Jeremiah, in chapter 22, verses 13 to 17, vividly portrayed, portrays his rebuke of King G.Y. Kim for building his palace through forced labor and injustice. He emphasized that true worship of God must be accompanied by righteous, righteousness and justice. Symbolic Actions to convey God's messages, Jeremiah often employed symbolic actions. These acts served, served as powerful visual aids to illustrate his prophecies. One notable example is the smashing of a clay, clay jar in the valley of Ben Hinnom, symbolizing the impending destruction of Jerusalem. Jeremiah chapter 19. Another significant act was wearing a yoke to symbolize Judah's submission to Babylon. Jeremiah chapter 27. These dramatic actions reinforced the seriousness of his messages and the reality of the consequences of disobedience. Personal struggles and persecution. 
Jeremiah's ministry was fraught with personal struggles and intense persecution. His unwavering commitment to delivering God's messages made him a target of scorn, ridicule, and physical violence. He was beaten, put in stacks, and even thrown into a cistern where he nearly died. Jeremiah chapter 38 verse 6 Despite these hardships, Jeremiah remained resolute, often expressing his anguish and frustration in what are known as his confessions. Jeremiah chapters 11, 18 to chapter 12, verse 6. Chapter 15, verses 10 to 21. And chapter 20, verses 7 to 18. These passages reveal the prophet's deep internal conflict and his ultimate reliance on God for strength. Exile and Return Prophecy of the Seventy-Year Exile One of Jeremiah's most significant prophecies was the foretelling of Judah's seventy-year exile in Babylon. In Jeremiah chapter 25 verses 11 to 12, he explicitly stated that the land would be desolate and serve the king of Babylon for seventy years. This period of exile was a direct consequence of Judah's persistent idolatry and refusal to heed God's warnings. The prophecy was fulfilled in 586 BC when Nebuchadnezzar II captured Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and exiled a significant portion of the popula population of Babylon. The announcement of the seventh 70-year exile was a sobering message for Judah. It underscored the seriousness of their sins and the certainty of God's judgment. Jeremiah's prophecy was not welcome as it contradicted the messages of false prophets who promised peace and prosperity. Nevertheless, his words proved true, demonstrating his role as a genuine prophet of God. The promise of of restoration. Despite the grim prediction of exile, Jeremiah's prophecies also contain profound messages, messages of hope and restoration. In Jeremiah 29 verses 10 to 14, he conveyed God's promise to bring the exiles back to their land after 70 years. This message was part of a letter sent to the exiles in Babylon, encouraging them to settle in the land build homes, and seek the prosperity of the city where they were the held captives. Jeremiah's assurance of restoration was rooted in God's unwavering covenant with his people. He emphasized that the exile was not the end, but a period of correction and purification. God promised to gather his people from all the nations where they had been scattered and bring them back to their homeland. This promise highlighted God's mercy and faithfulness, even in the face of judgment. The New Covenant One of the most profound aspects of Jeremiah's message of hope is the prophecy of the New Covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, he foretold a new relationship between God and His people one that would be based on an internal transformation rather than external adherence to the law. God promised to write His law on their hearts and be their God, and they would be His people. This new covenant would be marked by an intimate knowledge of God and the forgiveness of sins. It represented a radical shift from the old covenant which was often broken by the people's disobedience. The new covenant emphasized a personal, heart-centered relationship with God, paving the way for the coming of the Messiah and the establishment of the Christian faith. The dual nature of Jeremiah's prophecies, judgment and hope. Jeremiah's prophecies encapsulated the dual nature of God's dealings with his people judgment and hope. 
His messages of impending doom were not merely punitive but were intended to lead the people to repentance and renewal. The exile served as a means of purifying the nation and realigning them with God's purposes. Simultaneously, Jeremiah's messages of hope provided a vision for the future. They assured the people that God had not abandoned them and, their, and that their current suffering was temporary. The promise of restoration and the new covenant pointed to the time to a time of renewed relationship with God, where his loss would be internalized and his people would experience genuine transformation. The role of prophetic suffering. Jeremiah's personal suffering and perseverance also served as a powerful testimony to the role of prophetic suffering in God's plan. His willingness to endure persecution and remain faithful to his calling underscores the importance of obedience and faithfulness, even in the face of adversity. Jeremiah's life exemplifies the prophetic vocation's cost and the profound impact of steadfast devotion to God's mission. Theological and practical implications. The importance of faithfulness and obedience. Jeremiah's message to Judah highlights the critical importance of faithfulness and obedience to God. His prophecies demonstrate that obedience and idolatry have serious consequences, but they also reveal God's desire for His people to return to Him. The emphasis on repentance and assurance of God's forgiveness and restoration underscore the central themes of faithfulness and divine mercy. The relevance of contemporary believers. Jeremiah's prophecies remain relevant for contemporary believers, offering timeless lessons on the nature of God's judgment and mercy. They remind us of the importance of maintaining a personal heart-centered relationship with God and living in accordance with His commandments. The new covenant promise fulfilled in Jesus Christ calls believers to embrace the transformation that comes through faith and to live out the principles of justice, righteousness, and love in their daily lives. Conclusion Jeremiah's messages to Judah remarked by a balance of judgment and hope remains a powerful testament to God's unwavering commitment to His covenant people. Through his prophecies, Jeremiah called the nation to repentance, warned of the impending exile, and assured them God's promise of restoration and a new covenant. His life and ministry underscores the importance of faithfulness, obedience, and the transformative power of God's mercy. As we reflect on Jeremiah's message, we are reminded of the enduring relevance of his prophecies and the profound impact of living in alignment with God's will. The End of the Southern Kingdom 2 Kings chapter 25 The End of the Southern Kingdom of Judah is a profound narrative that captures the tragic consequences of persistent unfaithfulness to God. This period, marked by cycles of unfaithfulness and apostasy, ultimately led to the kingdom's downfall. The reign of Rehoboam and his successors illustrate the complex interplay of political, social, and spiritual factors that contributed to Judah's demise. The Babylonian conquest and subsequent exile were not just historical events, but fulfillments of prophetic warnings underscoring the gravity of forsaking God's covenant. Rehoboam's reign, a shaky beginning. Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, inherited a united kingdom, but his harsh policies and refusal to listen to wise counsel led, led to a split. The ten northern tribes rebelled, forming the kingdom of Israel while Rehoboam retained control over Judah and Benjamin. His reign marked 
the beginning of Judas' oscillation between faithfulness and apostasy. Despite efforts to fortify the kingdom, Rehoboam's spiritual leadership faltered. He allowed idolatry to flourish, setting a precedent for future kings. The Succession of Kings Faithfulness and Apostasy After Rehoboam, Judah experienced a succession of kings whose reign fluctuated between periods of faithfulness to God and outright apostasy. Kings like Asa and Jehoshaphat sought to follow God's commandments, initiating reforms to remove idolatry and restore proper worship. However, these periods of faithfulness were often short-lived as subsequent kings reverted to idolatrous practices. King Asa, 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 9 to 24. Asa, one of Judah's more righteous king, reigned for 41 years. He made significant reforms, removing idols and commanding Judah to seek the Lord. Asa's reign was marked by, rela by relative peace and prosperity as he relied on God for deliverance from enemies like the Kufites and Egyptians. However, Asa's reliance on foreign alliances in his late, later years indicated a departure from his earlier trust in God. King Jehoshaphat, 1 Kings chapter 22 verses 41 to 50. Jehoshaphat, Asa's son, continued his father's reforms and sought to strengthen Judah's relationship with God. He appointed judges and established religious education throughout the land. His alliances with Ahab, king of Israel, through marriage was a political move that brought mixed outcomes. While he tried to influence Israel positively, the alliance also exposed Judah to Israel's idolatrous practices. King Jehoram, 2 Kings chapter 8 verse, verses 16 to 24. Jehoram, son of Jehoshaphat, married Atalia, the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel. This marriage solidified an alliance with Israel, but also introduced Baal worship into Judah. Jehoram's reign uh, was marked by fratricide, idolatry, and a departure from his father's faithfulness. His actions led to God's judgment in the form of revolts and invasions by the Philistines and Arabs. King Uzziah, 2 Kings, chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. Uzziah, also known as Azariah, reigned for 42 years, 52 years, and initially followed God. He achieved military success, fortified Jerusalem, and promoted agriculture. However, his pride led him to unlawfully burn incense in the temple, resulting in leprosy. Uzziah's later years were spent in isolation, symbolizing the consequences of overstepping divine boundaries. The downward, downward spiral, Ahas and Manasseh. The range of Ahas and Manasseh represents some of the darkest periods in Judah's history. Their blatant idolatry and rejection of God's commandments hastened the nation's decline. King Ahaz, 2 Kings, chapter 16, verse 1 to 20. Ahaz embraced idolatry wholeheartedly, even sacrificing his son in pagan rituals. He made alliance, alliances with Assyria, introducing Assyrian gods into Judah's worship. Ahaz's reign was marked by spiritual and moral corruption, weakening of Judah's national identity, and paving the way for increased foreign influence. King Manasseh, 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 to 18. Manasseh, son of Hezekiah, reigned for 55 years and was one of the most notorious kings of Judah. He reversed his father's reforms, rebuilt high places, and practiced witchcraft and divination. 
Manasseh's reign was characterized by extreme idolatry and violence, leading to God's pronounced judgment. Despite a late repentance, his actions had set Judah to an irreversible path to destruction. The final kings, Josiah to Zedekiah. The last kings of Judah, from Josiah to Zedekiah, witnessed the rapid unraveling of the kingdom. Josiah's great reign brought a temporary revival, but his successors failed to maintain the reforms. King Josiah, 2 Kings, chapter 22, verses 1 to 23, and chapter 30. Josiah, one of Judah's most righteous kings, initiated significant religious reforms after discovering the book of the law in the temple. He destroyed idols, reinstituted the Passover, and sought to restore covenant faithfulness. However, his untimely death in battle against Pharaoh Necho of Egypt cut short these reforms. Kings Jehu Ahaz, Jehu Aikim, Jehu Aichin, and Zedekiah, Zedekiah, 2 Kings, chapters 23, verse 31, to chapter 25, verse 7. Following Josiah, Judah's decline accelerated. Jehu Ahaz reigned briefly before being deposed by Pharaoh Necho. Jehu Aikim, installed by Necho, reverted to idolatry and faced invasions by Babylonian forces. His son, Jehu Aichin, surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar, leading to the first deportation of Judah's elites to Babylon. Zedekiah, the last king, rebelled against Babylon, resulting in the final siege and destruction of Jerusalem in 586 BC. The temple was born, the walls were torn down, and the remaining population was either killed or exiled. The Babylonian Conquest and Exile The Babylonian Conquest of Judah was a devastating event that fulfilled numerous prophetic warnings. Prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel had long warned of impending judgment due to Judah's persistent unfaithfulness. The conquest resulted in severe financial collapse, famine, and the destruction of Jerusalem's infrastructure financial collapse and famine. The prolonged siege and wars drained Judah's resources, leading to economic collapse. The famine during the siege of Jerusalem was particularly harrowing as people resorted to extreme measures to survive. Lamentations chapter 4 verse 10 poignantly describes the dire conditions highlighting the severity of God's judgment on a nation that had forsaken him. Deportation and Exile The Babylonian exile marked a significant turning point in Judah's history. The deportation of Judah's elites, including the royal family, priests, and skilled workers, aimed to cripple the nation's leadership potential for rebellion. This periodic exile lasted 70 years as prophesied by Jeremiah and served as a time of reflection and repentance for the Jewish people. In Babylon, they faced the challenge of maintaining their identity and faith in a foreign land. Theological Reflections and Lessons The fall of the Southern Kingdom and the Babylonian exile offer profound theological reflections and lessons for both ancient and contemporary believers. The Consequences of Forsaking God's Covenant Judah's history underscores the serious consequences of forsaking God's covenant. He, the refuted cycles of apostasy and brief periods of reform illustrate the nation's struggle to remain faithful. The eventual judgment through conquest and exile was not arbitrary but a fulfillment of divine warnings. He 
serves as a sovereign reminder that God's patience while long suffering has limits when faced with persistent disobedience. The Role of Prophets The role of prophets in Judah's history was crucial. Figures like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel provided divine insight and guidance, warning the nation of impending doom while offering hope for future restoration. Their messages emphasized the importance of repentance and faithfulness to God's commandments. The prophets' perseverance in delivering God's messages despite opposition and personal suffering highlights their essential role in God's plan. The Hope of Restoration Despite the grim realities of conquest and exile, the prophetic messages also contained promises of restoration and hope. Jeremiah's prophecy of a new covenant under Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 31 to 34 and Ezekiel's vision of dry bones coming to life, Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14, pointed to a future where God would renew His people and restore their land. These promises were partially fulfilled with a return from exile under King Cyrus of Persia, who allowed the Jews to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple. The ultimate fulfillment is seen in the coming of the Messiah, who established a new covenant through His death and resurrection. Conclusion The debated kingdom of Judah, marked by cycles of faithfulness and sin, ultimately faced God's judgment through exile. The history of Judah serves as a testament to the importance of obedience to God's commands and the consequences of turning away from Him. The lessons from the, their kings and prophets highlight the enduring relevance of faithful, faithfulness, repentance, and the hope of restoration. As we reflect on Judah's history, we are reminded of the critical need to remain faithful to God and the transformative power of His mercy and grace. The Role of the al Habayit, the Royal Steward In the royal court of ancient Judah, a significant role was held by the al Habayit, or over the household. This was the title given to the Royal Steward, a position of great authority and responsibility. The Royal Steward, sometimes referred to as the Master of the Palace, or the one over the house, functioned much like a prime minister. This title held immense importance in the governance of the kingdom, overseeing the king's household and possessions, and acting on the king's behalf in matters of state. The biblical roots of this role can be traced to figures like Joseph in Egypt, who was appointed by Pharaoh to oversee all his affairs. Genesis 41:40. 45.8. Similarly, in the time of Solomon, we see that the office of the royal steward continued, second only to the king in authority. 1 King 4.9. This position was crucial for maintaining the kingdom's daily operation, particularly in the king's absence, as the steward would govern in his name and serve as a final court of appeal. One of the most distinctive aspects of this role was the symbol of the steward's authority, the keys to the kingdom. This signified the power to open and close doors to those seeking the king's origin. The steward has the power to bind and loose, exercising authority over decisions that were final and irrevocable, binding what others had loosed and losing what others had bound. Moreover, the steward was not merely a political figure, but was also seen as a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, guiding them with wisdom and care. This role did not end with the death of the steward, rather it was a position to be succeeded by another, maintaining continuity of authority and governance. 
In Isaiah 22, we see a vivid description of this office with the installation of a new steward. The symbolism of the keys and the royal garment, reminiscent of priestly attire, signifies the high status and unique responsibilities of this position. Thus, positioning to the New Testament, this imagery finds its ultimate fulfillment in the papacy. When Jesus speaks to Peter in Matthew 16, 19, he directly referenced this tradition of royal stewardship. Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here we see Peter appointed as the steward or prime minister of Christ's kingdom, much like the al habayit in the royal court of Israel. Peter's role, and by extension the role of his successors, mirrors the responsibilities of the royal steward. Just as the steward governed the earthly kingdom in the king's name, the Pope, as Peter's successor, governs the church in Christ's name. The authority to bind and loose, one held by the royal steward and rabbis in interpreting the Mosaic law, is now conferred upon the papacy in matters of doctrine and church governance. This typological connection between the royal steward of the Old Testament and the papacy in the New Testament underscores the continuity of God's plan for His people. The church, like the Kingdom of Israel, is governed by a divinely appointed leader who serves as a father to the faithful, a guardian of truth, and a representative of Christ on earth. In conclusion, the role of the Prime Minister in the Royal Court of Judah is a foreshadowing of the papal office within the Church. Both offices bear the responsibility of governing in the King's absence, carrying the keys of authority, and serving as a father to the people. Through this scriptural and historical lens, we can better understand the significance of the papacy and its vital role in guiding the Church throughout the ages. Thank you for joining us for today's episode, The Divided Kingdom, Southern Kingdom of Judah. We explore the spiritual journey of Judah, focusing on key figures like Rehoboam, Hezekiah, and Uzziah, as well as the powerful role of prophets in calling God's people back to faithfulness. We also delve into the fascinating role of the al habayit the royal steward or prime minister, who carried the keys of authority in the kingdom of Judah. This office, symbolized by the power to bind and loose, foreshadows the papal role in the New Testament, as seen in Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew 16, 19. The steward's role of guiding the people and serving as the king's representative finds its ultimate fulfillment in the papacy, which continues to govern Christ's church in his name today. If you found this episode insightful, stay tuned for our next episode, The Exile, where we will explore the fall of Israel and Judah and reasons behind their exile and the messages of hope and restoration from prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We'll also discuss the theological significance of the Babylonian exile and the prophecy of a new covenant. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and click the notification bell so you won't miss the upcoming episodes. See you next time.